Welcome to the mining and IIoT uh, webinar today. We're going to uh, focus really on two uh, main areas. One is the markets, and then using the suppliers uh, as examples of uh, how uh, the maximum advantage is, is going to be achieved in this marketplace. We do have uh, uh, signed up for the uh, session today a nice mix of people in the equipment and the software. And um, we've got governments and, uh, and, the, and also <clears throat> on the consumables. So we have a good mix of all the people here. So mining is a, an area that's already moving forward with uh, with with the IIoT and remote O&M for many reasons. Uh, the mining trucks are automated and remotely controlled. By 2030, the prediction is that many of the processes uh, to separate and beneficiate the orders will also be operated remotely. The incentive is high due to the remote locations and harsh conditions encountered at many mining sites. There's a lot of money spent for treatment chemicals, and the treatment chemicals uh, companies are companies that have been leveraging what we call the industrial internet of wisdom for uh, much of their revenues anyway. So in many cases, I think they're gonna be the leaders as we move into this uh, interconnection uh, uh, of all the people and what we call the uh, empowerment of the industrial internet of things with the industrial internet of wisdom. So the mining industry is looking to IIoT and remote O&M for safety improvements. Uh, we're gonna be finding some specific ones on mine ventilation here, and we'll get into that later. And uh, of course, all, also for all the processing and will be, for instance, you know, using the F.L. Smith example of tailing storage and uh, remote monitoring. But I think most importantly, what F.L. Smith has done, and it's been more in the cement industry than it has been in the mining industry, but, but I do think it shows the potential for the mining industry, <clears throat> is that they have a gain sharing program. So they will operate a cement plant, much of it remotely, and the improvements in operation over the um, operation prior to their involvement, uh, they will share those uh, profits with, with the owner. So, you know, that's the ultimate way to generate uh, uh, large, large uh, revenues, although some risk, of course, is involved there. Let's look at the markets. <clears throat> One of the things in, in all the different opportunities for IIoT in all the different industries, it turns out that there's relatively few decision, decision makers. First of all, in all these industries, there are large companies that <clears throat> buy most of the equipment. Uh, the situation <coughs> in mining is changing pretty dramatically. Uh, Glencore uh, dropped from uh, the leader <clears throat> It's down the list with uh, revenues falling from 209 billion to just 159 billion in the most recent year, and their capitalization is down to less than that of BHP. But nevertheless, the top mining companies have a market cap of over 700 billion. And orienting the opportunity in mining, the costs of mining are approximately a trillion dollars a year. So our estimate of an 11 billion dollar present expenditure for IoT is really only the 1% of costs. And of course, the potent potential for the future is for very substantial cost reduction and quality improvements. The top 10 iron ore producers account for over 90% of the world's total iron ore output. In copper, it's a similar situation, Codelco, uh, in Chile is the world's largest single producer of copper, controlling about 20% of the global reserves. 
coal is really concentrated. China is the chief coal producer, while the United States comes in second. <clears throat> and five countries uh, account for over 75% of the worldwide coal consumption. <clears throat> One side note there, despite everything else, it is uh, coal that's responsible for the largest upsurge in energy requirement of all the energy sources. And that's another important aspect for IIoT, which is when you're remotely controlling and monitoring, you can supply uh, coal-related uh, intelligence to those uh, operators of power plants, for instance, in Vietnam and Indonesia and India that, who are struggling without a knowledge base uh, in the area. <clears throat> we see the uh, move toward IIoT as um, moving pretty fast along with the development of the software and, and technology so, such as sourcing as a service. But the IIOW, which is the interconnection of knowledge, is uh, essentially in its infancy. So it's before even in the, in, in the software end of things, before you even got to SCADA and PLCs, you're just, you know, the raw sensor output is getting all sorts of uh, 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 ways that it's not being organized properly. But you have companies like Source One that are supplying and are improving the purchasing practices of mines by uh, being able to furnish all the filtration parts they, and valves and fittings and so forth. But our contention in the chemicals, but our contention is this is a very embryonic, uh, uh, rough uh, structure and that in fact, maybe you do have somebody coordinating some of those things, but the input, the knowledge input that goes into which chemicals should be pur purchased where uh, belong with you know the chemicals uh, suppliers and they should be the ones supplying that, um, that wisdom and the same for the valves and the pumps and so forth. And we're into a lot of those things. And so I think we're looking at uh, the IIoT and remote O&M from a completely different perspective than certainly the, you know, Accenture's and uh, a lot of your uh, prognosticators about uh, what the future is. And instead, we see, you know, IIOW as being much more important. Uh, but the two together are going to probably be uh, deliver even more than than the Accentures and these others are predicting from IIoT, and they're predicting, you know, huge $14 trillion uh, increase in GDP um, due to IIoT. <clears throat> but when you start looking at the mining equipment, you know, it's an $80 billion a year industry, but if a mining company sells autonomous equipment uh, to do that mining and autonomous, autonomous vehicles, it's actually remotely monitoring that $80 billion initial opportunity uh, rises substantially. And in terms of operating uh, revenues or uh, remote uh, operating in O&M, then those go way up as well. And the same for uh, pumps. Um, there's a couple billion dollars worth of pumps being sold for to the mining industry every year. And the installed asset value is uh, 30 billion or so. So any improvements in operation are a function of what you do with that $30 billion uh, asset that you have installed. And some of these other, you know, like the flotation and clarification and all the uh, centrifuges and things is uh, uh, 3 billion this year, liquid filtration, drum filters, things like that would be 2 billion. Air pollution control, except the fans of 4 billion. And then you take the fans for air pollution control as well as all the process and uh, HVAC fans and so forth, and you're talking a couple billion dollars. And so the opportunities are to obviously to reduce electrical costs, uh, reducing labor costs, reducing chemical costs, but also improving the product, which is maybe even 
more important, uh, certainly safety uh, uh, improvements, environmental. And we're going to be doing a little bit deeper dive uh, on Howden here in a minute because I think they have a, a very powerful uh, example for the other equipment companies. By the way, uh, please uh, interject questions as we go along. <clears throat> We're certainly open to them and uh, do have the time. The interconnection of all the inter personnel at a supplier company uh, is important. Interconnection of all the people at a end user company is important. And then the interconnection of everyone uh, around individual subjects uh, is equally important. And that's something that doesn't exist to any great extent. There's the book out, you know, the effect of silos, but essentially uh, each division seems to be in its own silo. Each plant seems to be in its own silo. And you really need uh, to interconnect all that. Also, as you can see here from the ARC chart, the, the value of uh, collaboration is a function of the time to implementation, implement it. And therefore, you need a system uh, which will deliver uh, the, the knowledge as needed. And we have uh, been focused for 30 years on systems that provide alerts, answers, analysis, and advancement. Uh, if, if we have a minute or two at the, at the end of the uh, session, we will be going into a, uh, ex uh, some examples that are, uh, we've, we've made at the Berkshire Hathaway Energy uh, Complex with 200 different plants. But essentially, we did nine hours of webinars on one $700 million problem that they have. And with the collaboration, or what even they said was wise, wise crowd decisions from those 80 people, it looks now as if instead of 700 million, they'll be able to reduce that cost to less than 500 million. And, but it does involve uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, combustion optimization systems. Uh, and we had input from Siemens and GE and Emerson and so forth. But there are some unique chemicals that uh, uh, no one had really considered for this application before that probably will be used. And some uh, technology from the uh, refining industry, which hadn't been used in the power industry before. So it's a unique, uh, I think, achievement. And our website, we do have a lot of free information on that particular uh, uh, initiative. <clears throat> The, uh, the treatment chemicals are certainly an important factor. Uh, and that use of treatment chemicals for all purposes will rise to over 30 billion in the mining industry. And about 20% of that uh, will be for water related chemicals. And as you can see, about a billion for uh, flocculants. And so, of course, the remote adjustment of of these chemicals uh, is one of the main ways to operate the uh, mines in the future. We've already gone into the uh, autonomous uh, mining uh, trucks, but um, let's stop for a minute and talk about Rio Tinto because I do think they capture the essence of what we believe will happen so they've been trialing the autonomous drilling systems and <clears throat> invested half a billion dollars just in driverless trains and uh, some of the other automation equipment. But they envision uh, in the mine of the future, not just automated haulage and drilling, but also automated mining operations, remote monitoring of mining operations and processing plants, condition monitoring of stockpiles, computer optimized flotation tanks, and autonomous trains, all controlled by uh, centralized operations centers. 
and the James Petty, who's general manager of the Mine of the Future for Rio Tinto Iron Ore, put it this way, it's a total system. The whole mining operation is planned in advance and is dynamic. It has a memory, it learns, it anticipates trouble and responds. Its neural path links interlink at light speed. It functions like the, uh, the brain the size of an iron ore province, coordinated by the control tower, the operations center in Perth. And my comment there would be the brain the size of the iron ore province is really the accumulated knowledge of all the chemicals, equipment, instrumentation, and software companies. And with open platforms um, and um, the transmission technologies that we have now, you know, all these, all this knowledge can be put to work continuously. And in a, a tier method as well. So it may be <clears throat> that the equipment specialist for a pump uh, wouldn't be called on uh, for a minor pump problem. But the more complex the problem gets, the more likely it is to go up the chain uh, of the supplier company to, uh, in many cases, somebody who might be, uh, you know, one of the most expert on the, of the world, at least for that particular pump. And so, you know, you've got Oracle and you've got <coughs> IBM seeing a big uh, growth for the uh, IIoT industry. <clears throat> and so there is a, a lot of um, support for it. Uh, we are going to look at uh, some sample suppliers. I think that's a good way to um, get a, a flavor of all the opportunities here. ABB is remotely monitoring and, and controlling dragline health with a whole program here with remote connectivity hardware and software. But they do have their technical experts available continuously to uh, offer, offer support. And they can provide associated reports, et cetera. Andritz is a good example of an equipment company that's not leaving the development of the software to others. And they've got what they call brainwave. But they also have predictive control algorithms. So they can use all the many years of experience they have in the mining industry <clears throat> to set up the automation and the uh, various um, uh, variables within the thickener to optimize the uh, performance. They're doing the same thing with uh, flotation control systems. So they use Brainwave again <clears throat> and uh, have the predictive uh, control al algorithm. And they're reducing the variability in the cell, le cell level control to uh, optimize cell operation. Now they they have uh, competitors. <clears throat> so if you're a flotation system supplier, you can go to somebody like Baggy and uh, get software that uh, you can incorporate as well. So I think that's another thing is that there needs to be um, uh, a alignment of all the different companies and all the different levels of everything from the soft from the instruments through the software to the equipment to provide uh, the uh, interconnection that's that's needed. Uh, Cisco's uh, heavily involved and has <coughs> excuse me take a drink here. Uh, Cisco has a connected mining solution, <clears throat> and it uh, manages multiple applications, including dispatch, safety, telemetry, voice, and video on a single, reliable, secure network. <coughs> to 
Uh, you can it, it will predict impending equipment failures weeks before they occur. And of course, that uh, is the ultimate is to uh, for the smooth running of these uh, plants. But they're into digital tailings, secure mine operations, asset visibility and monitoring, and the complete connected plant, which has been installed in, in thousands of processing plants around the world. Uh, Gold Corp has implemented the Cisco Connected Mining at the center of which is a robust underground network. It's at its northern Quebec mine and allows workers above or below ground to act, be uh, access for it for via uh, a variety of wired and mobile devices. And it does have an intelligent ventilation system, although it may be more crude than the one we're going to be talking about because it talks about ventilation fans being uh, turning on and off as needed. Uh, and uh, so it, it, the estimates are the savings just on the uh, ventilation system will be, you know, in over a million dollars a year. Uh, Cisco's ETTF system has been installed at all the uh, process plants of Anglo, Anglo uh, uh, Platinum. And the benefits for the company include more standardized, scalable solution that can be expanded at lower cost, flexible infrastructure that improves responsiveness and faster decision making, uh, the ability to maintain quality production uptime with better visibility, and mitigated security risks such as unauthorized uh, actions by uh, individuals and the inter interception of data. <clears throat> So, the uh, Eaton is an interesting example. <clears throat> it offers a broad, unique uh, mix of electrical, hydraulic, and filtration components, assemblies, and services, <clears throat> including safety solutions designed for critical operations. <clears throat> the field-based service capabilities offer, offer system analysis, equipment testing, and a host of life cycle extension solutions uh, to support site installed products. So they're very big in the wireless monitoring and, and control and have complete wireless solutions for surface and underground operations. <clears throat> and what intrigues me about this is that they also have lots of equipment and now is the opportunity for them to be uh, to move forward and be a leader in measuring, for instance, the filtration health of or the health of filters in the mining operations. But you know, here are all the things that they're doing in the mining operations, from remote control of uh, excavators to ore treatment plants and mine slope wall data, water supply control systems. And then, of course, underground with the ventilation fan monitoring and detection of moving machinery. And they do have even gas detection systems. They, they actually have their own O2 and some of their other uh, monitors. <clears throat> but they're also a major filter manufacturer. Uh, they made a number of acquisitions. Uh, they were originally in the hydraulic filters. And now uh, when they <clears throat> bought the Dover, group. They have a wide range of process filters and things as well. And they are one of the, uh, along with AMIAD, they're the largest suppliers of self-cleaning filters for the mining industry. Um, and in this particular AMIAD installation, uh, there are often large numbers of filters in a cluster. Uh, those filters at the water intake locations may, may be remote to other operations. Therefore, the benefits of wireless transmission of filter health are substantial. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, these are small 12 inch diameter filters, but they're self cleaning and they, in, in, uh, they start to, ca uh, to carve out a much bigger niche uh, sand filters and bag filters and, and cartridge filters and things that they've competed against. Uh, they, uh, they seem to be doing very well, but the one negative is you have a lot of small filters, and therefore the maintenance becomes 
a challenge. However, if you're constantly and uh, monitoring them, and particularly a lot of these filters are going to be wherever the water is coming from the rivers <coughs> and lakes, maybe at some distance, but with remote monitoring of filter health, you can make this asset uh, much more reliable. And the same would be true for bag filters and hydrocyclones and strainers and filter presses and all the other filtration equipment that's used in the mining industry. So, so we'll be interested to pursue uh, with Eaton their thoughts on, on taking this to the next level in the mining industry. Uh, Emerson is very big in, in the area and has a number of examples uh, such as this one in a phosphate mine where they're protecting uh, critical assets and avoiding uh, downtime and, and repair. <laughs> and, uh, so they have the, uh, again, they have the drag line uh, predictive maintenance uh, system among other things that they're offering there. The Avoqua has a particular challenge but opportunity. It's a company that has grown from possibly 200 different acquisitions over time. And bringing all those, uh, all that knowledge to bear on a particular mining application is uh, a huge challenge. But I do think with IIoT, <clears throat> it's not only doable, but could uh, certainly uh, provide Avoca with with a huge uh, huge opportunity. And uh, every place that you see the vibrating uh, signs here, uh, those are uh, places where remote monitoring is already uh, being offered. So FL Smith has uh, systems that uh, rely on their their knowledge of the uh, grinding and flotation that's been developed over a century to uh, control froth height, pulp level, pH, concentrate parameters, tailing flow rate, aeration rate, lime addition, uh, collector flow rate, and frother flow rate. Grunfos uh, is has a lot of knowledge about some of these uh, applications for pumps, as you can see here with their uh, in situ leach and, uh, leaching solution. Uh, and it's a challenging one because you've got to handle very low pH levels, or and in some cases, high concentrations of acids. And uh, so having the automatic uh, systems for dry material uh, preparation and reliable dosing as well as the pumps is in their uh, uh, sphere. And this, I think, is the, uh, puts them in very good stead to take it to the next level as well. <clears throat> Honeywell obviously is uh, involved with a whole range of uh, specific applications from crusher level control, conveyor loadout, inventory monitoring, Flotation and separation, concentration, digestion, leaching, slurry pumping, process water, smelting and refining, etc. <clears throat> and then they do have some very specific technologies, such as one on the belts for conveyors, where they uh, monitor the idlers and belt wear. It provides an integrated solution in this regard. Uh, now, we basically have two slides on Howden, and I'm going to just display the slides and then ask some of the Howden, Howden people for their take on it rather than just get mine. But essentially, Howden provides mine ventilation optimization. The result is both healthy air and safe levels of combustion uh, gases at each point. And I'm going to then skip to our, our second slide on it. So they're, they're offering uh, a number of levels, including, you know, complete optimization. So let me go back to the first one again. And uh, uh, who would like to volunteer from Howden to kind of walk, walk us through this whole program? 
Robert, this is this is Rob Bush. I'm with Howden SimSmart. Um, I'd be happy to to walk walk through the the solution that we offer. Um, right. SimSmart is essentially Howden is a company that's grown similar to other companies you've mentioned previously, grown by acquisition. One of those acquisitions recently being SimSmart, who is a provider of uh, coal mine ventilation solutions with regards to both automation and the fans. This is the solution that Howden can now offer after having made SimSmart. Um, within the SimSmart autom automation package, we the, the brain and the heart of the system is our smart exec software. Uh, and, and an important thing to understand about that software is it's both a SCADA, as um, the conventional uh, use of the word would describe, so it does both data acquisition, uh, control, and monitoring. Um, of anything related to air quality and ventilation, but the, the software is not only capable of, of complying with SCADA type function, it also is capable of use for mine ventilation modeling as you would do in the past with a VNet PC or event sim type modeling software. So essentially it provides the user with a turnkey ventilation tool that can be used to both model production scenarios that may happen according to future mine development, but then use that same model to actually run the system. Um, and the way we generally do that is in a, in a um, fully implemented system, you'd have two servers uh, on the surface, one for modeling, one for control. That way you never risk any sort of overlap uh, or confusion in the system. Uh, that that could risk the integrity of the control system. Um, so uh, our, uh, I guess, arrival to the solution or part of the evolution of the solution, the, the solution we offer, uh, as I say, it began with a software and has grown to now offer a uh, plug-and-play hardware solution. And, and plug-and-play is a very key uh, descriptor of the system uh, and, and it, that's something that doesn't really exist in the market uh, today and when I say plug-and-play essentially our equipment <coughs> is designed and tested in our factory and pre-programmed with all the necessary logic in our own factory facility such that when it arrives to site there is no automation programming necessary only configuration which can be done by a ventilation engineer or someone who's not necessarily an expert in automation. Um, and our control panels are, are basically able to control uh, all components related to ventilation in the system of a, a mine ventilation system. So can control um, VFD equipped fans, which means you can regulate their speed basically from zero to 100% in increments of 1% with a VFD or soft starters or direct line on off fans. Um, we also provide our own um, pre-manufactured regulators, uh, also known as dampers in some cases, and those regulators uh, are manufactured with automated actuators to also be able to <clears throat> interface with the uh, system. So that's kind of an overview of the two components from both a software and hardware standpoint. Um, and our hardware interfaces with flow sensors and, and gas sensors to be able to regulate according to actual uh, air conditions. So with regards to what the, what the system is really able to accomplish, um, first and foremost, uh, from a standpoint of safety, as you had brought up earlier, you're able to monitor and guarantee the air quality in areas where uh, where you have workers and equipment based on our own, our integration with third-party tracking systems. Um, and therein lies the key, that integration with third-party tracking systems where we actually uh, basically mirror or, or interface with a, third, a tracking systems database we pull that information into our, to our own database. We assign air quantities um, in an intelligent way to uh, to equipment and personnel. So, for instance, equipment you may assign air 
uh, air quantities or flow quantities per horsepower of equipment is generally the way the industry handles this. Um, so we're able to ensure quality working conditions. Um, <clears throat> when I say quality working conditions, I mean uh, appropriate quantity of airflow, um, low, constant, low gas concentrations or alarms and modulation of the system according to high gas concentrations. If, for instance, carbon monoxide levels go up in an area where you have too much equipment. Um, so the, the ability to ensure that quality working environment is, is first and foremost. But naturally, when we integrate with tracking systems, we're able to, and, and given you have to have a proper mine design and leverage the use of your air regulators and proper placement of air regulators and bulkheads accordingly, but you're able to direct air where you need it, when you need it, rather than providing, for lack of a better word, equal air to the entire mine at all times. What this means is um, it's, it's, it's really twofold. You're able to, from a capex of uh, mine ventilation infrastructure, you're able to leverage in a more efficient way your existing infrastructure and possibly be able to optimize the operation rather than have to invest in that next shaft. And these represent massive costs. Um, and, and on the other side, you're able to modulate, uh, for instance, you talk here about level, level five, complete system optimization. Um, that's where we use advanced control strategies and algorithms to actually relay current needs in certain parts of the mine back to uh, your main fans and then adjust those main fans accordingly and naturally the main fans are the major energy consumer. So with with many corporations these days both you know faced with high high electricity costs um, as well as faced with the need to reduce their carbon footprint or reduce their greenhouse gas emissions um, it, the incentives are twofold for, for the implementation of a system like this. Um, and, and as you've said, it's certainly the mine, mine of the future uh, where, you know, not in any other industry do we, or in anyone's house even, for instance, do you ventilate everything uh, all the time without really modulating according to real-time needs. So uh, in the mining industry, this is uh, a bit more complex as a lot of things are. You mentioned durability, remoteness, uh, but this is the direction the industry is going and technology is catching up to be able to provide it. Um, you had mentioned in earlier slides that CapEx related to ocean infrastructure is maybe a $2 billion market, I think you said, uh, worldwide. <clears throat> However, on a mine site, the, uh, is with regards to energy consumption, our experience has been the number one energy consumer on a mine site is generally the plant but the number two energy consumer is, is mine ventilation. Um, and, and with our system in, in operations, like you mentioned, Gold Corp Eleanor is one of our uh, primary uh, case studies or primary, I guess, full implementations uh, that where we have the system. And they've been able to save over 50% of their energy costs related, related to ventilation. So uh, that's a big number um, and, and generally, a system's payback period is quite short. Um, you know, three years would be a long payback period for a system like this compared to the savings that uh, that can be had. Um, and and we've also, as a company, explored gain sharing type contracts where uh, we're able to leverage. You know, to, in order to make the system more approachable for clients uh, that may not have the capex available to to budget for investment of a full implementation we're able to uh, leverage those savings and then uh, basically bill at a percentage of savings in order to to recover our our cost and profit on the on the system so um, I think this model is not like you mentioned not necessarily uncommon in the market uh, today so um, I'm not sure. It, oh, and one other point I did want to make, you've, you've talked a lot about remote monitoring. The system is set up so that it generally works <clears throat> through a fiber optic communications backbone in the mine, and then that communicates back to servers in an office. But we we are also able to provide remote support um, 
uh, for like remote IT support uh, from our own offices where our software engineers can support any questions or doubts or uh, uh, issues the client may be having with the system. And furthermore, we're able to uh, install centralized monitoring and even control, if wanted, um, systems at, say, corporate offices, or you mentioned Rio Tinto's Mind of the Future, where uh, they, they are able to control and monitor from a central location. Uh, this is already a capability uh, that we have with the system. So um, it's... It's absolutely a, a growing technology. Uh, I think the incentives <clears throat> to implement it are too strong for it to not uh, really infiltrate the mining market, uh, you know, th during the next 10 years. So um, I don't know if you or anyone have any questions or if there's any points I've missed you'd like me to talk on a bit more. Yeah, I think we can talk about a few more questions if anybody else has one. Uh, tell, tell us a little bit more about the ability to control speed at 1% increments, I think, uh, or flow at 1% increments on your fans. How is that done? Yeah, yeah so generally, um, when you have uh, fans with VFDs installed on this variable frequency drive, um, you're able to change the speed of the fan in 1% increments. Now, you do have to take in consideration uh, motor capabilities, for instance, most manufacturers will recommend uh, at what what would be the minimum speed that you can safely run the motor at without risking harm to that motor. So <clears throat> when I say zero to 100 percent, the a variable frequency drive is capable of, of running at any of those speeds. However, the motor it's attached to may not uh, be uh, specced in such a way it could do that. So most motor motors will have a minimum speed of say 30 percent so you would actually modulate fan speed between 30 to 100 percent um, in one percent increments and this is all pre can be configured according to the user's needs or the motor's needs in the system so you can put minimum speeds to ensure that you're not going to do any damage to a system um, and so what what the system can do is uh, you can do, for instance, flow-based speed adjustment. So you may have a flow sensor, for instance, in the cone of a, an auxiliary or even a main mine fan based on current needs that in the mine or in the particular, particular development area, that flow need uh, is relayed back to the, the, the fan in such a way that the fan's going to adjust its speed. It's almost imagine a cruise control. You set flow and then the fan may adjust slightly to, to make sure it's accomplishing that flow all the time. And it can adjust, like I say, in 1% increments, generally from really 30 to 100% uh, of its uh, possible speed. Would you sometimes use several different fans uh, rather than one in order to... Um maximize the uh, you know the energy efficiency uh, uh, given the fact that some of these fans may not run at optimum uh, efficiency uh, through that wider range yeah sure so so one thing the system can do is we can actually put in performance curves or fan curves associated to each fan in the system and then the user can establish a range in which you actually want to operate so um, if there are ranges that are inefficient or ranges that could, for instance, put a fan into stall conditions, you mm -hmm. can program those ranges out of the available speed range of the fan. Another complexity would seem to me is that you're, uh, in many re cases, I can envision a push-pull type relationship that, you know, the uh, a, flan, a fan downstream is dependent on a fan upstream somewhere in the mine. Uh, for the flow of air that's uh, you know it's receiving, so it seems a fairly complex um, challenge to get all the fans in concert, uh, and particularly those that may rely on each other. Yep, absolutely. And uh, most my, most systems we we've worked with these days are push pull systems. Earlier, do we have a 100% exhaust or 100% intake type system? So um, there again. Uh, you can we can set what we call flow biases, where um, the flow of a certain fan is biased to maybe the requirements of another fan. So if a certain fan has a, has a required 
flow requirement. Uh, such, for instance, one case is uh, one issue you deal with in mine ventilation is recirculation, where where in that say a say you have an on off fan in a level that is providing 10,000 CFM, but the flow that is being supplied to that fan is only 7,000 CFM. So what happens is that excess of 3,000 CFM is actually available to recirculate and you're not ventilating anything because the flow uh, that is supplying an auxiliary fan on a level always needs to exceed the flow it's providing to a development front, for instance. Uh -huh. So you can set minimum requirements, and this is where the system actually is going to integrate with not only flows read from fans, but we also, you know, leverage flow sensors placed in drifts. So you can actually measure the flow in a drift, and you can set a minimum flow at any time any time in that drift, and that flow would be dependent upon whether uh, the fan it's supplying to a develop, the fan supplying to development heading is on or off. Um, so if a auxiliary fan supplying to a development heading is off, then obviously it doesn't because there's no assets in that development heading, then obviously the flow required to supply that fan is, is a non-issue. But as soon as that fan turns on, then there also has to be available flow in the drift it's pulling from to ensure that you're not going to have recirculation. And so all of these kinds of configurations uh, are used to ensure the system behaves appropriately. And um, it's it's a very, how do I say, it's not like you can just pack a system up, ship it, and, and install it, and it's ready to, ready to go. Uh, from a plug-and-play standpoint, it is ready to go. The equipment can interact with each other, but the configuration, as as you said, any mine is quite a dynamic environment, and the the user um, is is who is really going to determine all these sorts of configurations. Um, we when we deliver a system, we provide three levels of testing. Uh, we call them CAT, FAT, and SAT tests. So the CAT test is configuration acceptance testing. Um, a FAT test is factory acceptance testing, and the SAT test is site acceptance testing. And during that first stage, the configuration acceptance testing is where we sit down with the user um, and collaborate on exactly how the configuration of the system needs to operate according to uh, production scenarios and, and all these sorts of things and recirculation. And, and this is all worked out prior to installation. And then during the site acceptance testing, we actually would invite we invite the user to join us in our factory, and we actually go through each piece, each control panel, um, with its actual sensors attached and actual VFD models attached, like it will be once installed on site. Um, we go one one by one, each equipment uh, approving it with the customer that it works as it should, and then naturally the site acceptance testing is doing all this one more time on site um, with the real equipment in place. But <clears throat> these three levels of testing during the implementation are what we use to to ensure that the system arrives on site um, in as much a plug and play uh, configuration or plug and play state as possible. Now you're uh, buying things like the sensors from some of the instrument companies, but it would seem that uh, their health is critical. That because one of the big advantages you're bringing here is increased safety for the mine as well. But uh, reliable you know, measurements, for instance, of CO uh, at all points in the mine would be critical. Uh, how do you ensure the reliability there? Absolutely. So. Um, you know, it's it's interesting. Different. I'm not an expert on the, on gas sensors, but our experience is different gases are more reliable to measure than others, um, due to the nature of the actual method of measurement. So, for instance, I know CO, for instance, is much easier to measure than oxygen levels. Um, so you sort of have to take these things into consideration, and you have to have, I guess, what you would call a hierarchy of bias. Um, but, for instance, if you are worried about measuring oxygen levels in, in general in a mine, uh, your CO levels, uh, high CO levels will be a problem before low oxygen becomes an issue. So you do have to leverage sensors in such a way that you're using the most reliable measurements. 
Um, and then we've also uh, been through a iterative process of determining the ideal flow sensors for uh, ventilation on demand type systems uh, like we offer. So there's some detailed characteristics that are more important in a ventilation on demand system than just a monitoring system. Uh, for instance, quick response of the flow sensor um, and uh, stable uh, stable readings from the flow sensor. So in other words, not, not having a noisy signal that's uh, jumping uh, jumping all over the place and then requires data filtering. All these things take time. So um, we have we do work closely and uh, work closely with our sensor providers and obviously uh, do quite a bit of testing. And really, that's where we make our decisions. Is we have to test and prove these sensors work ideal ideally for what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think that's all very impressive, and I think underlines what uh, much of what we're trying to achieve here today, which is that equipment companies such as Howden uh, can uh, greatly increase the revenues, but they really have to understand the processes uh, with, in which they're involved and just not the fans that say, for instance, that are being used there. And obviously you're demonstrating a, a great deal of knowledge about mine operations and, and knowledge that's been put to, to work by Howden. So I would certainly uh, commend you and the organization for taking that step and providing us with a, a good example of, of the uh, empowerment of IIoT with IIOW. Absolutely. And, and it's important to mention that we are uh, a, a mining company. So um, as as a PLC company who just manufactures and sells PLCs, we mining mining ventilation would be a niche for them. Uh, whereas with within Howden, you know, and within the Howden SimSmart, which would be the automation division of Howden, we employ over 15 ventilation engineers uh, that are basically available to do engineering studies. They work with the implementation of systems. So these are mining trained and mining worthy experts, if you will. And and it is the synergy of that knowledge um, between mining and mine ventilation and automation is really really embodies the expertise of of what health can offer now. Yeah, that's 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 very impressive. But even that, you know, in our opinion, is just the beginning. And uh, when you think of Colfax generally the first thing that uh, comes to mind relative to the mining is that um, Colfax has a, uh, uh, um, a, a condition monitoring system, Colfax N1000, for uh, all, all the rotating equipment in a mining operation. So <clears throat> this seems to be, you know, when you envision a, a cloud-based system like Rio Tinto that's operating all these processes. Uh, here's one more set of Colfax products and an advanced solution, which can be added to the, the total. And so I think the challenge for all these organizations is to provide the intercommunication among these divisions. And, and uh, you know, the question I'm sure you've asked and, and maybe is being implemented is uh, getting Col Colfax lubrication systems involved in a lot of these operations. Absolutely, and the the software solution is, is widely applicable. We've already gotten multiple requests from customers, hey, can you, can you provide this sort of solution with pumping? Or can you provide this sort of solution with compressed air management? So, um, uh, and you mentioned here lubricants and, and fluids. So it's, at the end of the day, whether you're moving air, water, compressed air or, or whatever, at the end of the day, it's a study in fluid dynamics and these sorts of physics and uh, logic are, are what's built into the system. So um, it, it certainly will grow to have wider applications for sure. Oh, well, well, thank you. That's some very, very valuable uh, input. Yep, thank you. Um, <clears throat> move on, you mentioned the pumps were, uh, next slide does oh, cover. Uh, 
the pumps and covers. Well, uh, this steel blanket ship from Houghton. Uh, yes. You hear me? I'd like to throw in one little thing. Uh, sure. We will be exhibiting and demonstrating the uh, smart exec system at the Elko Nevada Mining Expo and at the uh, North American Mine Ventilation Symposium, both in June. Uh, the event symposium this year is at uh, Colorado School of Mines. That's... So we'd be happy to see anyone there and further explain any details, but we will be demonstrating the system. Yeah, that's that's good. We'll want to note those uh, dates and our uh, insights here. If you want to maybe uh, send me a link on that uh, or just send me a little bit more information on it, we'll make sure that gets into the the uh, our, our news. Okay, sure will. Good. Th fun. Thanks. And then uh, we were just talking about pumps and things, too. And, of course, uh, for a lot of these operations, pumping is a big energy consumer and very, uh, very critical. And someone like ITT, who has, uh, with all the acquired companies over the years, a lot of the big names in, in slurry pumping, they've got uh, decades and decades of experience with all the problems you can run into with slurry pumping and so <clears throat> they do have a continuous monitoring system with 24-7 uh, uh, support uh, that diagnoses faults and uh, provides uh, a wireless uh, a program uh, uh, and, and, and is, uh, uh, is, is one of the examples of, of what they're doing in the mining industry. Uh, uh, they just had a recent uh, order uh, for some additional pumps at uh, Phelps Dodge where they already had 90 uh, of their pumps involved here. Uh, Camara is uh, uh, supplying chemicals for this industry and offers uh, solutions, not just the chemicals for alumina, copper, nickel, gold, iron ore, uh, coal, phosphate white pigments, ceramics, and aggregates. Uh, Nalco um, is another chemical supplier and <clears throat> he has developed solutions as well. It's got a uh, specific anti-scalant uh, program and uh, this is uh, has been implemented at the Boddington mine and has had some big uh, savings generated some big savings for the, the for the company, and uh, has <clears throat> uh, eliminated the uh, severe scaling and improved uh, operations at the plant. Uh, Siemens is another uh, provider of both the instrumentation and the software. Uh, flotation cells is one area where they have been involved. The uh, Salinas has uh, uh, been active in the area and a gold mining operation in western U.S. was having difficulty regulating the acid and lime feeds in its process water system. It was leading to scale deposition in the water lines. Uh, solids in the reclaimed water were also contributing to the deposition problem. Uh, and this required significant downtime for removing scale. The mine uh, connect, contacted Solanus for help. And uh, basically, the, the bottom line is that a, a new treatment program using Azalta anti-scalants uh, improved the mill's profitability by more than $2 million a year. And uh, so, there's a, a, a certainly a, a, a big potential for all these chemical companies who already have uh, solutions understanding to be providing the remote O&M. Uh, we do have somebody from Solenis on on with us today. Any any comments that uh, you would care to make? Yeah, hi, hi Bob. This is Paul Valk from Solenis for people that are on the, the webinar on the global market director for mining. Um, but I, I think you hit the key points is, you know, at Selenis, 
whether it be in our our, our mining business or other other large segments like pulp and paper and other utility waters. You know, where we see the real value is the combination of the chemistry, um, our remote monitoring and control solutions, which is our on guard platform, uh, and, and those are solutions such as real time uh, scale monitor uh, in situ. So it's it's a direct read of the scale inside of, of process systems. Uh, and then, as you mentioned earlier in the webinar, uh, it's the domain knowledge that is so critical. And as we go through and uh, begin to digitize our business, not only um, our interface with our customers, how we collaborate internally, share those best practices, so we can take that institute, institutional and domain knowledge and, and solve problems more quickly around the world. Um, but how do we take that knowledge and put it into the sensors? How do we create those algorithms uh, to not just control an anti-scaling in response to uh, scaling conditions, but really start to be predictive and prescriptive? So we can start to uh, read what's happening upstream to predict what might scale and when so that we can optimize dosage and, and be more proactive. Uh, on thickeners, you, you mentioned uh, thickeners and tailings uh, in, in, in the past. Uh, you know, in mining operations where uh, solids and solids density in these thickeners is all about, you know, drives recovery. Um, well, you know, we're working with our customers to optimize that, and again, when we start looking what's upstream of that thickener and what's downstream, how do we take those inputs, some inputs that people might not even realize. Some things can't even be measured with a sensor today, but because of our uh, unique domain and applications knowledge, our unit operations familiarity, uh, working with customers, we can start to build those algorithms uh, to control the systems where sensors might not even, where a physical sensor might not exist. Um, so we're doing this in mining. Uh, we've recently increased our capabilities around having a platform, uh, a big data and analytics platform that can take uh, data from a mine, from a pulp and paper operation, uh, and understand what the critical uh, inputs are. Uh, and even if there's significant gaps, uh, the algorithm is smart and can learn um, mm -hmm. And, and incorporate even what's there and what's not there to significantly optimize an operation. And what's unique about mining and chemistry is what we see in our customers. What's, what's unique is if you look at a mine, and a mine might spend a, a small to medium sized mine, processing costs might be $200 million a year. You go to a very large mine and the processing costs alone could be a billion dollars a year. Now, when you look at the chemical spend, it's minuscule. It's 0.25 percent to maybe a half a percent of their of their total operating spend. But yet, you know, if that anti-scalant isn't working and an autoclave goes down, or your heat exchanger on your CIL circuit isn't operating and performing, you know, optimally, you're you're losing ounces of gold. Uh, if your thickener operation isn't working and you're not driving solids, you're not driving recovery. Uh, that can increase uh, or decrease performance and recovery. And so we see a huge opportunity to leverage the Internet of Things, optimization, digitization. We're working with some of the biggest mining companies right now uh, with their uh, digitization groups uh, and working and partnering with them on projects right now in Nevada, in the Caribbean, in um, other places around the world. So we, we see it firsthand. We're super excited and uh, just echo a lot of what we've seen from um, the, the previous example. So thanks, Bob. Yeah, and I think you made some very good points. And and uh, if I could just reference that, that one point you made is you you have to understand what's happening ahead of the thickener and downstream of the thickener, as well as just what uh, what's happening in the thickener itself in order to optimize that performance. And all you know, I think what you're saying is it's all integrated. And and obviously, Solanus is 
uh, has gained that knowledge of the whole operation, which is really critical. Absolutely, and it's even more critical as if anybody's you know spent a lot of time in mining, uh, you, you have a lot of knowledge and expertise that is retiring. Um, a lot of these mines have cut down on you know their staffing levels, whether it be at the headquarters level or even at the mine site, and so companies like Solenis that actually have that deep domain expertise in decades upon decades of unit operations familiarity, not only of you know the CIL circuit or the heat leach or the thickener or the flotation circuit or the grinding circuit, um, but to do that with the combination of the chemistry is invaluable. And as we go and we digitize that as we take that stuff that's in the human brain and we uh, port it to algorithms, uh, that can be, again, not only just, you know, stage one is kind of reactive, but then stage two, stage three, which is predictive and uh, prescriptive, um, that's where we're really going to unlock tremendous amount of value. Um, and, and we're, we're going to do it with our capabilities. We're making acquisitions. There's probably some partnership opportunities um, because mines have so much data today, uh, they just don't know what to do with it. Um, and even some of the smartest, biggest, most sophisticated mining companies are struggling with this, but at least we're talking about it and we're doing something about it today. And, and your topic is very timely, so we appreciate it, Bob. And I think uh, it was well summed by the Rio Tinto uh, analysis of a brain the size of, of an iron ore province uh, in Australia. And, uh, you know, a good portion of that brain is the actual specific knowledge. You mentioned the people retiring and so forth and the fact that you're accumulating that knowledge. And again, I think that's the central point that that we're making in this whole uh, initiative is it's the IIOW or, or wisdom that uh, is going to empower IIOT and make make it happen in a much bigger way. Absolutely. Agreed. Well, th thanks for the input. That's very, very illuminating. <clears throat> um, then you've got people like some some symbotic wear um, who's also into the monitoring and standardized information uh, systems. <clears throat> and they are they have partners such as GE Intelligent Platforms, Schneider Electric, OSI Soft and so forth. Um, the last example that uh, I'd like to make here is is Xylem, and again, uh, Xylem has a huge opportunity and a huge challenge because they have all these different, uh, you know, people like Leopold is a hundred year old company in sand filters, and they've been buying companies like Andera, and you know they bought flight uh, eight or ten years ago <clears throat> so they have all these different divisions you know, all of whom have opportunities or uh, uh, products that are usable in the mining industry and they have assembled some, some pictorials to show to show that but the longer term <clears throat> opportunity for them is is huge and you know people like Wetico <clears throat> who are into the ozone generation uh, in fact, it was a, 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 a Wetico product that uh, uh, the BHE may very well find useful for solving their NOx, NOx problem. But uh, that being aside, the mining industry uh, is where a lot of opportunity uh, rests for Xylem. So that's one more company that can take, take advantage of uh, this whole IIoT to improve the intercommunication between uh, all its separate divisions. And the, um, uh, I'm going to just end on one more note here, head the show here, and then just go to our website for a minute here. <clears throat> so the information on our market report shows up immediately in the top of our uh, right in the middle of the page there. There are, uh, so that's that IoT and remote O&M. Uh, there, the previous um, uh, weekly IIoT uh, webinars have been taped, and this one's going to be taped, and it's going to be put up 
and various different places. But one of the places that, and by the way, these are the upcoming ones, is chemicals next week, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, pulp and paper, so forth coming up. But here are the recorded ones, and you can go to the YouTube uh, versions of all these, uh, and, and, and including the one last week, uh, uh, which was on the treatment chemicals, and people like Selenus were, had uh, extensive presentations uh, on uh, there as well. So that uh, those are some of the um, uh, references uh, for you, and then. The, the one last thing I did want to to uh, talk about was how we're taking that to the ultimate level with the uh, uh, the uh, Berkshire Hathaway uh, 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 system. We uh, uh, we are basically uh, have a complete uh, program just for for one utility with seven uh, percent of the gas transmission in the United States, but whether it's treatment chemicals or fans or pumps, in fact, Howden has been involved. We've had, uh, we've had nine hours of webinars uh, on solving their problems uh, at two of these plants, and uh, Howden was very much involved uh, in that because the fan, uh, any, any changes to the fan would be costly. In fact, if we eliminated the SCR, uh, we'll eliminate any big fan changes. But anyway, the uh, this, this is all up there, and I think uh, it is the next level. We essentially uh, uh, believe that ultimately that um, that there will be uh, IIOW systems for every large complex, uh, whether it's the 100 or so largest power companies in the world, you know, the 50 or so largest mines, the largest chemical plants, et cetera. And uh, with systems like this that uh, provide all the information for uh, one one operator, uh, we do think we're taking it to the to the next level. Uh, any other questions that uh, people might have before we sign off? Uh, if not, we'll make sure you get copies of the presentation, and we look forward to uh, having you uh, on uh, subsequent calls. Thank you very much.